So we've talked a little bit about this idea of offense-defense balance, and so far the conversation has been that it's related to technology and it's related to geography, uh, but a lot of this ends up intersecting with this idea of military doctrine. So this is what we're going to talk about here today. Um, Military strategy um, and the military doctrine is really about the question about how do you anticipate that you're going to be using your forces, right? How are you going to deploy your forces? Are they going to be used for direct attack, um, where you're going to be sort of invading territory, or is it going to be used for indirect attack? Maybe you're blowing stuff up um, from afar. Are you engaged in direct or indirect defense, right? Direct defense, I've dug a trench. Um, maybe indirect defense, I'm using hit and run tactics. Um, in, in, in something like that in guerrilla warfare style. Um, and military doctrine really gets at that. It says, this is how we imagine conducting warfare to achieve our sort of strategic objectives. And that's gonna intersect with technology because the technology determines how force can be projected, what's possible, um, and sets a lot of the parameters. But a lot of what happens in warfare determines, it, it is a function of how states think about that technology, how they deploy it, how they invest in building it up, and what they do with it. And so when we think about military doctrine, we're, we're talking about sort of a subset of grand strategy, right? A grand strategy is, um, you know, here's our broad overarching goals for the state. Here are all the tools at our disposal. Um, how do we think that we sh those tools should be used to achieve our goals and our objectives? Uh, but military doctrine sort of narrows that down and says, okay, within that, this is what's imagined in terms of military action. Um, and what do we need in order to do that, right? So what are the objectives? What are the goals the the deploying military forces? Um, how are we gonna think about what we actually can do militarily? Um, how do we need to build up forces, um, invest in technology to be able to accomplish those kind of things, right? If you are thinking about military doctrine as a land power, as, as a country that needs to build up an army, you're thinking about tanks. If you're an island power and you're thinking about preventing invasion by sea, you're probably thinking about aircraft carriers or attack submarines or that sort of a thing, um, the hardware is going to follow from the doctrine. Um, and because of that, right, when we think about the offense defense theory, about the kind of um, tools countries have to project force, about whether those tools can be identified easily as offensive or defensive, all of that feeds back into this idea of, of military doctrine. And so I'm just going to kind of run through a couple different types of military doctrines to kind of illustrate how this might um, might operate and how it might change how we think about things. And so I'll start with an offensive um, military doctrine um, where countries are sort of thinking about military force and the use of military force as something that you're going to use to actively defeat adversaries and to achieve specific outcomes and goals on the ground. And so um, one country that has historically had a offensive doctrine is Australia, um, which talks about forward posture within their military doctrine sort of conversations. And their thinking is Australia is a, a largish continent, um, at least for an island, um, but it's sparsely populated. There's only a handful of cities on the, on the coast. And that means that it's you know, always vulnerable to invasion potentially. And that the best way for Australia to secure its future is by being proactive out into the region of the broader um, uh, Pacific region of trying to respond to problems and challenges before they um, result in in people or material showing up in Australia. So a forward posture in response to that geography and that, that population dynamic. Um, Germany prior to World War I um, employed an offensive doctrine. They built their military with the assumption that they were going to attack their neighbors. They were going to defeat them decisively in the field. Um, similarly, the United States has had an offensive doctrine, um, particularly after September 11th, the United States has sought to go out and destroy networks of terrorist organizations to topple states that are supporting terrorist organizations. Um, these are examples of, of offensive doctrines, right? And if you want to do that, you're probably going to need numerical superiority. You're probably going to need offensive military hardware, and you're probably going to need a geographic network to be able to use that appropriately, right? So a network of, of broader um, bases that you can use for staging areas and you can deploy from. So there's a lot that goes into these kind of um, doctrines and they tend to be used primarily by uh, great powers. We could also talk about a defensive doctrine where the goal isn't necessarily to destroy an adversary or to achieve a particular outcome on the ground, but rather to identify your adversary, identify what would 
serve the interests of your adversary and prevent your adversary from getting that, right? You're, you're, you're in a denial mode um, rather than an affirmative, this is my goal mode. And so a classic example of this is Great Britain um, compared to continental Europe during the 19th century where US, or I'm sorry, where, where British strategic thinking was that no single country should ever come to dominate the continent, that that would be a threat to the UK. And so Britain plays this role as strategic balancer, intervening in conflicts, helping one side or the other, all with the idea of we don't want any one country to become too powerful. And so when France is the country that is you know, on the brink of taking over the continent, the UK does what it can to counter France, when Germany unifies and becomes the dominant player, um, Britain and France are now allies and Britain is working to prevent Germany from taking control of the continent. Similarly, um, the UK has sort of taken that view in terms of global supply lanes historically, thinking about things like um, Gibraltar, thinking about things like access um, to the Suez Canal, that, that um, denying other countries the ability to control these um, these strategic passageways was long a, a British goal of their foreign policy. And I think that fits with this idea of a deterrent or a, of a, a defensive doctrine. Another example might be the United States um, during the 19th century with the Monroe Doctrine that the United States articulates this idea that um, European powers should not be in the Western Hemisphere and that the U.S. will reject and, and oppose and resist any effort to set up new colonies. And so when uh, France and um, Spain and Britain invade Mexico, uh, in, in the 1860s, the United States moves in militarily to support Mexican independence and try to push out France and uh, prevent them from setting up a permanent colony in, in the Americas. If you wanna do this sort of thing, um, you're gonna need a numerical uh, counterbalance, right? You're going to need a large enough military to counter your adversary. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be overwhelmingly um, you know, decisive because you just need to be able to prevent your adversary from achieving victory. You may need a mix of offensive technology and defensive technology. You may want to think about balancing and strategic partners, um, but it's going to shape your, your thinking in a, in a much different way than an offensive doctrine. I could point to a deterrent doctrine, making it exceedingly painful for um, an adversary to advance against you. This is where the whole point of your, your military is to inflict pain um, to prevent it from ever having to be used. And so the a classic example uh, would be during the Cold War. For a couple of decades, the United States and the Soviet Union developed um, sort of a mutually assured destruction dynamic where if the Soviet Union launched at the United States, the United States would respond with full thermonuclear war and obliterate the Soviet Union, and it would be so devastating and cataclysmic that the Soviet Union would be deterred from taking that step. And likewise, the Soviet Union developed a, a nuclear deterrence that would prevent the United States from striking the Soviet Union. Other countries have done this as well. Switzerland um, sort of famously has you know, dynamite or explosives on bridges and tunnels so that if an invading force comes in, they can um, blow up their infrastructure and potentially trap an adversary within the Alps, um, relying upon the, the environment to, to, to make it um, just cataclysmically awful to try to invade. Um, another example of this um, is Taiwan. And Taiwan's sort of an interesting country which has had to adjust their doctrine over the years. So initially when Chiang Kai-shek um, and the nationalists leave from China and go to Taiwan, the plan is that they are going to return and they're going to return in force and they are going to um, retake mainland China. Um, by the 1970s, that sort of has faded as a dream and they are shifting into a defensive doctrine where the thinking is we need to prevent China from being able to project into our sort of uh, our, our territorial waters and, and, and be able to prevent them from being able to um, threaten Taiwan. Um, and for that, you need an effective Navy and you need um, uh, a different military posture. Now they've shifted into perhaps a deterrent doctrine, which is that Taiwan no longer believes that it can defeat China at sea um, with, with a, a strong Navy, it assumes that if there is an invasion that Taiwan will lose. Um, and the goal is that they will organize local resistance and guerrilla warfare to make the occupation as miserable and painful as possible with the hope that eventually China will be pushed back out, um, through this, through the strategy of, of pain and suffering and just making it so difficult to hold. And this, I've actually seen this sort of play out in terms of the, the technology that gets used. And so I was, in Taiwan a few years ago and I was sort of touring this harbor and, and, and the guide pointed to um, several 
Taiwanese Navy ships. And so there was a, a, a destroyer that was had been sold by the United States to Taiwan. It was shiny and new and it was well painted and it was fancy and had, you know, all sorts of technology hanging off of it. And it looked like really great. And then right next to it was a tank transport ship uh, that was a rusted out hulk of a World War II vessel that looked like it hadn't been moved from dock in about 30 years. And that, that fits with the idea that if you're um, planning to reinvade uh, China, you probably need to be able to bring some tanks and that ship is important. Once you shift to a defensive doctrine, once you shift to a deterrent doctrine, a, a tank transport ship is essentially useless. Um, whereas a, a U.S. destroyer with state-of-the-art communications and radar um, and sonar technology is absolutely essential. So again, gets at this idea that the kind of technology that you're going to be using for um, a Turret doctrine is going to be very different, right? Numerically lighter, probably. Maybe you need defensive technology. Maybe you need tactics. And you probably want transparent um, preparation, right? You want parties to know if you invade, this is likely what's going to happen. If you launch a nuclear strike at my country, I can respond in this way. And you want that to be as clear and as transparent as possible. And then a finally, final doctrine or approach that I might um, flag for you, and this is not sort of in the classic... Um, doctrines that, that political scientists have sort of worked on and thought about over the years, but I think is, is useful to kind of think about it because there are, are a number of countries that do develop their military forces um, for non-conflict oriented doctrines, um, where the idea is not that I'll be using my military for invasion or for defense. I don't worry about invasion or defense. Um, instead, my military forces are likely to be used to participate in humanitarian interventions, in UN peacekeeping operations, in global health operations to provide you know, medical care, to provide um, quarantine and disease control, those kind of things. And so there are states that, that maybe fit with this. And so if you're Canada or Ireland or Ghana, you actively are participating in um, global peacekeeping and, and humanitarian operations. States like Germany and Japan um, also have, because of their, their history and their, their um, tradition of non- military intervention in the end of World War II, have thought about what they're doing with their military forces and have participated as um, sending communication specialists or medical professionals to participate in global um, humanitarian operations, but they wouldn't necessarily participate in a military capacity. And so if that's what you're trying to do with your military, again, a numerically light military is certainly, you know, you can, you can get by with that, uh, but you're going to want to invest in, in developing specialized skills, um, specialized tasks. So again, you know, I can operate global communication infrastructure. Um, I've got, you know, the ability to handle battlefield surgery or medicine. Um, I just maybe speak English and can participate in an international peacekeeping force um, in a, an international language, that kind of training, and then cooperation with intergovernmental organization partners or with allies so that uh, military forces can integrate seamlessly into a broader um, command structure. All of that is something that you would invest in and try to work to, to build up within your military forces. Um, and again, gets, us the, gets at this idea that the, the, the picture that we have about how we anticipate military forces being used is gonna shape the training and the technology and the size and the deployment of our forces that we have. And, and different countries make these determinations differently at different points in time.